district court, if like you're in, your, and you're in federal court, that's again court of, like federal court of appeals, Supreme Court. Then usually the decisions are a lot better because they, they have law clerks and people working. Right? Are the courts still backed up? I know during they like got crazy. super backed like up. Crazy. Oh, yeah. they still are. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, we're probably from the date of filing to the date of trial, probably three and a half years. Damn. Is that crazy? Three and a half years? Yeah. And it depends on the court. We have lawyers that work in California, Utah, you know, Arizona, Nevada. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. Truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. All right, guys, got my lawyer on the show today. I'm very excited for this one. Ryan Sandstrom, just coming off the Supreme Court case yesterday. I'd love to hear about that, but yeah, how's it going, man? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. What I, Honestly, what a what a privilege, what a blessing. It's yeah, cool dude. to be with you. I can't wait to dive in your story. I know a little bit about it, but yeah. let's start off with the Supreme Court yesterday because not every lawyer gets to make it to that stage, right? Yeah, I've, I've done some court of appeals work here and there, and then yesterday we had a case. I've been fighting it for four years, and we had oral argument yesterday, and it's an $8 million insurance case. Mm-hmm. So um, I think it went pretty well. Uh, you, you know, when it's going well, when the justices ask you less questions than they ask the other guy. <laughs> so I was the, I was the appellee. So I, I didn't, we won at trial court. We won at the court of appeals. Yeah. They appealed Supreme court. Took, I should clarify Arizona Supreme court. Right. Um, they took it up and, and the justices were just peppering the other guy. Mm. I, I kind of felt bad for him. Wow. Like, like literally the first comment from one of the justices he said, you know, I've, I've read the appellant's brief and I don't understand your argument. Mm. And that moment, all the nerves that I had inside, <laughs> I was like, I'm good. I'm yeah. all right. No matter what happens from here, I think we'll be all right. I'm curious if you know the win rate on appeals. I'm assuming it's low, right? You know, it depends on, on the type of case because the, if, if the court reviews it, what's called de novo, which means like, again, as, like all over again, mm-hmm. um, they can review everything. And so on de novo, it's probably like, maybe 15 percent 10 percent like it's pretty low but if they review it for what's called abuse of discretion which means the lower court judges made a decision and it's not like a legally it's a legal it's a factual question or some admissibility question right it's a long way of saying it depends on on the type of case yeah but uh, on de novo it's still pretty low i mean yeah. maybe 10 percent. that makes sense i, th- yeah. I think this one 99 percent we win this one. wow yeah. that's good have you ever had to appeal a case oh yeah yeah for sure i mean we're not perfect either. You know, we've had we have had bad rulings and stuff like that. But we actually, the two that I did appeal, we won those appeals. Nice. So, yeah. so when it comes to bad rulings, is that basically j- the judge or um, people are just getting too emotional and it's not a fair ruling? Yeah, you know, what, what's what stuff you appeal from. So to, be, to clarify, like a factual decision by a jury, like that's the outcome that the jury decides. Right. The judges make the legal decisions. So the only thing you're appealing from is from a legal decision of a judge. Mm. Say, for example, like they allowed an expert witness to testify that you didn't think should testify. Mm. Or if they allow a piece of evidence. It's not like Suits, bro. Like, <laughs> suits, I love that show. Dude, suits, it's amazing. It's like, we filed a motion and then we're in court tomorrow. <laughs> it's, not, it's not even close to how it works. Yeah. In reality, to get to court, you have to submit every single piece of evidence to the court. And the court reviews and approves everything. Mm. So there are no surprises in trial. But there's a lot of things that you know decisions have to be made coming up to evidentiary wise so a lot of that stuff you know there there can be wrong decisions when that right. happens so in our circumstance we had an expert witness this is years ago that we didn't think was should have testified and and the court allowed him to testify mm. and we were right like he I, he certainly should not have testified it changed the outcome of the case, yeah. the case. so ended up winning that one on appeal so nice. the judges i think they're trying to do their best you know what i mean and when you're dealing in state court, those guys don't have law clerks. Like they don't have people working for them. Mm. It's just them. And so they're, they're overwhelmed. They're overloaded and they make bad decisions sometimes. Yeah. If you're in district court, if like you're in, your, and you're in federal court, that's again, court of, like federal court of appeals, Supreme Court, then usually the decisions are a lot better because they, they have law clerks and people that work for right. them. Right. Are the courts still backed up? I know during they like got crazy. super backed like up. Crazy, oh, yeah. they still are? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, we're probably from the date of filing to the date of trial, probably three and a half years. Damn. Is that crazy? Three and a half years? Yeah. And it depends on the court. We have lawyers that work in California, Utah, you know, Arizona, Nevada. Um, so it depends on the court. California is like four years, four and a half Dude, years. Dude, a lot can change in that amount of time. 100%. And I feel bad for the people that go through hard situations. Like, you're like, let's go, let's go take it to court. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the defendants, like insurance companies, banks, you know, big companies, they know, mm-hmm. right? They know that it's going to take four years. And if you're dealing with a small company or mom and pop, like they know that they, you can't push it very hard. Right. It's going to sit there and you're going to be harmed. So it kind of forces. Dang, I wonder if there's a way to fix that. Cause you really can't, since it's all in person, there's no way to s- scale it. 
Yeah, you know, some courts, and Arizona's one of them, they tried to create, like, different tiers of cases. Mm -hmm. So, like, if it's a certain amount of money, then it doesn't go all the way. Okay. So, like, if it's under 50K, and California did this too, like, if it's under a certain amount, then they, like, expedite it. So, you only get, like, less discovery, and they only, the timelines get really, really short. So, if it's a case under 50K, it's, like, six months. Got it. Which isn't bad. But if it's anything that's substantial, 300 grand or more, which is most cases, mm -hmm. let's be honest, um, then it's at least years. You think they would prioritize those more than the smaller ones, though? You know, you would think. Um, I, what they did is they, they had those the small ones, they actually pull those out of court altogether. Mm. So instead of having a judge and a jury do it, they have a lawyer do it. So literally we get assigned by the Supreme Court saying, hey, you have to take this case and be the like pseudo-pretend judge. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. I've done that before <laughs> where... It's, we become the arbitrator, right? And you get to make the ruling, which is kind of absolutely, yeah. So. so you've litigated over a billion dollars in cases. Billion dollars. How stressful is that, man? Oh, it's hard to hard to explain. Yeah. Um, a l stressful, <laughs> I mean, to say the least. Yeah. Over. I mean, I've been doing this twelve years now, and uh, yeah, m my advice, my decisions matter. You know what I mean? Like, if I get if I'm wrong, then that, there's a lot on the line there. So right. um, my stress levels. For a long time, we're really, really high. Um, I, you're always fearful about making a mistake, right? You, mm. you always want to make sure that you're ahead of things. So there's there's a lot of taking the time doing it right, making sure you're ahead of things. But there's no amount of no amount of hard work and no amount of diligence can prepare you for everything. Mm. And and that's a hard reality to accept, right? Is you can work as hard as you possibly can, and there's still some outcome that you can't control, right? And lawyers, they we'd love to control the outcome. We'd love to control, you know. We, we do our very best to avoid all those risky situations, um, but we, we can't control everything. I mean, that's yeah. just the nature of it. But it, it's, it's stressful, man. It impacts yeah. me for sure. Because at that volume, people's lives are at pretty much on the line, like their, their livelihood with yeah, that amount of money. 100%. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, that's in the aggregate too. You know, some, we've had cases that are, you know, $100 million lawsuits in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And these are companies that people built, you know. I mean, they're, they're, or they're big loss cases where there's catastrophic, you know, damage or whatever, or, or there's, you know, business disputes. It's, it, you want to do the best for people. That's and that's it. Actually, shifted for me, and I'm sure we'll talk about it. But like, it shifted from like being fearful of getting it wrong to shifting my perspective to now I'm providing value and a service to them that they couldn't do for themselves. Mm. So now it's a blessing. So I, my whole perspective shifted, and I say, you know, what a blessing, what a sweet thing it is for me to serve them in the way that they can't serve themselves. Mm -hmm. And and that that minor little transition in my mind made it go from stressful to an opportunity. And so now when clients call, I'm not mad about it. I'm not frustrated about it. Or like, oh, that guy's peppering me again. Mm. It's like, hey, that guy needs my help, and I can serve him. Wow. And I get that, that's been a really, really critical thing for me, even if it's stressful, even if it's, if it's hard. Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below, and here's the episode, guys. Now I feel confident enough to be able to help. Yeah. And in a way that they couldn't do it themselves. It's a That's a thing. huge shift. Yeah. Because I know we'll get into your story. Yeah. Um, with all the stress, it took a toll on your health, right? And you were actually severely overweight. And in 2020, you had a near death experience. Yeah. Yeah. So I was probably 30, 35, maybe 40 pounds heavier than I am right now. I still got a little bit to go. You know, <laughs> everybody does, right? Um, yeah. So <laughs> happened, man. <laughs> kicked my butt for whatever reason. You know, it hit people differently. Yeah. Like some people got really messed up by it. Some people didn't. Um, it really did a number on me. And I, I was relatively healthy. I didn't have any underlying conditions other than being stressed out of my mind and overweight. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, ended up um, basically worried about waking up in the morning. Wow. I mean, to the point where, you know, I was in the hospital. I was 17 days isolated away from my wife and kids. Jeez. Um, on July 3rd, 2020, I guess technically July 4th because it was at like 3.30 in the morning, I didn't want to go to bed. Mm. So I, I was up and I was really, really anxious because I, I was convinced that if I fell asleep, I wasn't going to wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. My oxygen levels had dropped below 90 and that was the threshold to intubate. Wow. Um, and so they were talking about intubating me and I was like, I heard horror stories. My, that, yeah, a ventilator, right? My nurse was like, yeah, if if you get put on a ventilator, you, like you don't come back. You're done. Yeah. It's like, it was less than 50% at that point. And this is early days. Like I was the first person that I knew to have Wow. Um, and so the anxiety obviously didn't help as well. So, yeah, I was convinced I do not want to be intubated. But at the same time, I was really nervous. Like, what happens if I don't wake up in the morning? So I sent a text to my wife at 3.30 in the morning on, like I said, technically July 4th. It was the morning, like that July 3rd night. And, and I texted her to the life insurance information, the bank account Whoa. passwords. I wrote a letter to my wife and my kids 
And, and I said, if I don't wake up, here it is. It's like, it's next to my bed. And, uh, obviously, thankfully I woke up, you know, mm. and, but, uh, all the things that I was worried about and stressed about before that, you know, I was, I, I had this perception of perfection is what I call it. I was pretending to the world that I was perfect. Mm. And, uh, you know how that is. We all want to show this like strong self. Look, look, look at me. I'm strong. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. all the right things. Yeah. I had a soft underbelly myself. I had, I had problems in my own life and, um, and I wasn't owning those. I wasn't having hard conversations or anything. And, and when I, when you're in that moment, the only things that mattered to me, like at three 30 in the morning, like wondering if I was going to wake up was my relationship with my family and relationship with God. That was right. it. Nothing else mattered. And I wasn't scared of failure. I wasn't scared of, you know, having a business go under. I wasn't scared of anything. Mm. Um, I, but what I did become scared of is I thought, have I lived a valuable and important life? And kind of asking myself that question, I've said, I've, I've lived my, most of my life out of fear mm. um, rather than out of faith. And it just shifted my perspective. Obviously, woke up the next morning, and it took me a little while to figure this out. It wasn't like this aha the next morning. I was like, I got it. You know? right, right. It took me some, a while to figure it out. But thankfully, it landed over the next maybe six months or so as my body healed. I realized that my, my job is to, provide, is to be the best version of me and to give it away to the world and to live a valuable and important life for myself and for others and do things for them that they can't do for themselves. And I mean, that's the Christian way. You know, mm -hmm. I literally do, what, what, what is true influence, right? It's Robert Cialdini's in his, in his book, Influence. He says, he says, true influence is not what somebody thinks about you. It's what you make them think about themselves. Mm. And that became my goal. I said, I need to become a 10. I need to become the best version of me so that other people, when they look at me, they don't go, wow, that guy's awesome. They say, wow, if he can do it, what can I do? Amazing. Yeah. So try to try to become a, a positive influence in somebody's life, for, even for, even from afar. Yeah, living life with purpose, right? Hundred percent. Yeah, because it's so easy to fall into that trap of just money. Yep. And appearance, especially these days, oh, dude. And it almost requires you to make that much money to realize how much it doesn't fill you up. Right. I yeah. think I think that's accurate. Yeah. Because it's easy to say that when you've done it. Yeah. But people watching this that are on that journey of making their first money, yeah. it's probably a bit harder for them to understand. Totally. I mean, they're thinking, oh, once I get to the million mark or once I get to whatever the threshold is that you're thinking in your mind, then I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. um, what I've often said is external gratification will never create internal fulfillment, mm. ever. So you can get a bunch of money and you can get a bunch of stuff and you think that that stuff is going to make those feelings, but it doesn't. Right. So if you're not happy along the way, if you don't make the conscious choice that this is goodness, I'm doing valuable for myself, and I'm doing value for other people, it's not going to all of a sudden flip a switch when a big check comes in. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've had some really, really big months. I mean, we had our biggest month ever in December. We, we did over a million dollars in December. Damn, just in a month? Just in a month, yeah. Wow. So we'll, we're on track for three million in, in 60 days. Amazing. Um, which, you know, we'll get into that part of it too. I mean, that, that was unheard of three years ago. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was just the corporate, you know. Right. Small. You were working for someone three years ago, right? Yeah, yeah, I was a cog in a big wheel. Yeah. Right. And so now I'm doing it for myself. And, and here we are making this crazy money. And what's crazy is when that money comes in, that sounds great, right? You know, yeah, it's fun to have the cars and the watches and all that. I don't, I don't even really care. Mm. Take that all away. You know, like take, take all the, for me, it's the growth. It's the development. It's the process. It's the joy of developing something and having a team that I get to employ and Im influence their life in a positive way. Mm. And what's so crazy is the moment that I took my mind and I took the prize away, I don't need the money. What I need is value. I want to provide value for them and value for me. And I want to do it as hard as I can because life's important, life is valuable, and I can serve them. Wow. And as soon as that, that shifted, I, I stopped focusing on the money. Guess what happened? Money started freaking pouring crazy, in. Right? Yeah, I mean, just like crazy. I, it's, it blows my mind sometimes. Similar story with me, man, and yeah. a lot of my friends as well. Yeah. It's pretty wild when you make that shift. You know, at first, you're not going to be making the same money because mm -hmm. it's not your main focus, but in the long run, with yeah. the purpose and the intention, it, I feel like people are just gravitating towards me right now because yeah. I'm just providing them so many different perspectives and outlooks. It's the, you're the go-giver. You're, you're giving, 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 and it's, it all comes back to you, right? Yeah. So I, I have a, a book, and this is, I haven't actually announced it at all yet, but we have one that's in the works behind the scenes, and it's called Mindsets Plus Skill Sets Equals Assets. Mm. And the whole idea is like assets is the result of a proper mindset and skills to back that up. It's, it's kind of the be, do, have. People have talked about that, right? Mm -hmm. Be somebody, do it, and then you get it. It's, you don't focus on the money. You don't focus on the have. If you do that, it's super empty. Then you, you're kind of a crappy person, and you don't have very good skills, but you're right. focusing on more, more, more. But if you focus on becoming actually a good person, 
doing goodness because it's good and it's right, and then figuring out the skills that you need to effectuate that goodness, I mean, the money is, it can't not flow. I mean, it's going to show up because you have a proper mindset. You're doing it for, I'm doing this to bless other people's lives that can't do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. And, and to take stress away from them, like what a blessing that is. You Absolutely. Know? So then I got to figure out what skills do I not have right now in order to make that happen even better. So naturally, the outcome is going to get better and better and better the more you lean into that. So the more you lean into the money, the more empty it becomes. Yeah. Speaking of skills you're trying to learn, you spent a quarter million on masterminds last year, which yeah. is a lot. Yeah. So I want to hear about your experience. Do you think it was worth it? And which ones did you join? Easy. Yeah. Um, I spent, a, I actually tall, tallied it up, it was $287,000 last year Wow! Um, on masterminds and groups and, and VIP coaching and all that kind of stuff. I had never done a lot of that beforehand. Um, it's paid off in space. I mean, heck, we did $3 million in, in two months. Yeah. I mean? So, I mean, that's a 10x return right there. Um, acknowledging that I, even though I probably have the most education in most of the rooms that I go into, I went to school for eight years, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a lot of time learning. I still don't feel like I have all the answers. Mm -hmm. And so acknowledging that other people have more answers that I don't, even though I might have more formal education, um, has been all, has a huge difference. So wow. groups that I joined, Eric Spofford, shout out to Eric. Um, he has a really cool inner circle, high-end entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And Wes Watson, I've joined his group. Um, I'm actually, after this, I'm going to go, I'm in Miami with Eric and Wes this, this weekend. Nice. So, um, Yacht Mastermind, just 10 people, really tight group. Uh, Keaton Hoskins, I do one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the muscle I know yeah, is yeah. on your show. Um, so Keaton's an amazing, amazing person. Um, so I, I do one-on-one -on -one coaching with him. Nick Santanastasso. Nice. So Nick is one of my absolute favorite human beings. If you don't follow Nick, follow him. <laughs> um, literally, he's uh, no legs, one arm, and is one of the most inspiring people I've ever met. So I spent a lot of money on Nick um, to help me build and scale the coaching practice. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Renee Rodriguez. Yeah. Renee is an amazing speaking coach. I've spent time with money, money with him. Uh, Ryan Pineda, obviously. So um, he and I have teamed up on a deal together, but I've spent a lot of time in his uh, mm -hmm. wealth cons and masterminds and things like that too. So um, just really good people. Man. Amazing. Really, really good people. And I'm, and I'm just connecting with guys like, you know, Austin Rutherford and, and Mark Evans and those guys. So there's, there's even more opportunity coming. I up. love that mindset. And you've been able to scale your company $10 million in two years without any paid ads. That's right. Which in the legal space is insane. Cause I feel like lawyers run paid ads on billboards, Google ads, but you're not doing any of that. I haven't spent a dime in advertising. Wow. Just word of mouth. Not a dime. So here's, I, we, we call it the Amplex system. So I, I love Latin words. So Amplexus is a Latin term for surround and embrace. Mm -hmm. So think about it. And how, how can you acquire clients, right? If you have really, if people say word of mouth, that's kind of a simplistic way of saying, well, I hope somebody gives, drops my name in that moment. Well, what's, what's the point of billboards? What's the point of a TV commercial? It's to identify somebody when they're in their moment of need, they think, oh, I remember that jingle. Mm -hmm. I got in a car accident or I need a bankruptcy attorney or whatever it is. I remember that jingle. And so they call you in their moment of need. And same thing with Google. Like the whole idea is in their moment of need, they're Googling for you. So the same thing with, with an organic marketing method is my job is to identify the ideal client, identify their moment of need, like when, they, when in time they're going to need me mm -hmm. and who are they talking to in that moment. So say, for example, a bank, a, a, a small business client, right? They say, hey, I want to start a new business. And that's a, that's a great client for me. Like we do a lot of business transactions, right? right? Internal governance, contracting, all that stuff. So who's that person talking to? They're probably already talking to an insurance agent. They're probably talking to an SBA banker, mm -hmm. right? So then I go, okay, you're already in the room with somebody. How do I create a relationship with the guy that you're already in the room with? Mm. So in their moment of need, my name gets dropped anyway. Wow. It's the same idea as a billboard, right? Yeah. It's the same idea as Google. It's just I'm creating a, a, a good, valuable relationship with, I, I call them my traps, Called trapping rather than hunting. Mm. I'm not looking for one client one at a time. I'm looking for one guy that can send me client after client. After so client. smart. Yeah. Yeah. So so that that's been I mean a huge huge game game changer. And then this is a big part of it, is I never ask for a client. Never once. I mean we've been working together. I've never asked you for a client. Mm -hmm. Hey, I never even asked you for a referral. Right. Instead, I provide value. Mm. Right? I do everything I can to make your life better. Sometimes I'll do legal work for free. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, just to create a relationship where it feels like there's this um, you know, almost like a reci reciprocity, like, Hey, that Ryan really hooked me up with that. I owe him. Yeah. Right. It's almost like Dwight Schrute from the office. right? Like, <laughs> you, you owe me. So that's the whole idea is, is, is you create that law of reciprocity. I provide goodness for them and they're going to look for ways to bless my life. So we have, you know, box tickets, son's tickets. We do pool nights. We do mm -hmm. dinner nights. 
We do continuing education for other lawyers. We do continuing education for insurance agents, for SBA bankers. We, pro we come and provide them lunch. And we're not asking for leads. Mm. We're just providing goodness in their life. Wow. And they go, man, that guy's really helping me out. He's really doing goodness. How can I bless his life? Right. So the next thing, next thing you know, they got a client in their office. They say, hey, I'm getting an SBA. And they go, hey, do you have a shareholders agreement? Because I have a good buddy of mine. Mm. And then one last piece that I'll share that, that's really important is don't, don't pass out cards, dude. I hate that. <laughs> dude, you give them a card, what does that happen? It ends up in your pocket or on your bedside table and gets thrown away two months from now. Right? too old school. So I say, look, if you have a client right there, say, hey, do you need a lawyer? And they say, yeah. And I say, hey, I have a friend of mine, just like a warm referral. Ask them, ask your referral sources to put you in a group text. Mm. So I get a group text. Hey, Ryan, my buddy here needs a lawyer. I'll let you guys talk. Now I control the conversation. Right. It's not soliciting. You know, it's not, it's like there's, law there's laws for lawyers, how we can acquire. Clients. Yeah, yeah. But that's not soliciting at all. It's literally just a warm referral from a friend. I love that, dude. Yeah. That approach, I actually do it with podcasting too. Yeah. So like instead of approaching guests one-on-one, -on -one, which I do, yeah. uh, it's more effective to approach talent bookers or mm. talent agents who have mm. hundreds of clients, mm. people that own masterminds like Dan Fleischman or yeah. Steve Sims who just came on. They yeah. have 150 interesting entrepreneurs. Yeah. So focusing on key relationships, 100%. I think you could do that in any industry. And, and that's I mean, really the Amplex system is not unique to law. I mean... It just happens to be that that's where it works for me. So create a, create a referral network of people that feel like they owe you something. Yeah. But that means that you have to do goodness for them. It mm -hmm. means you have to, like to your point, you got to do do them a solid for a long time before they ever sent you a case. I'll give you an example. I sent a lawyer, a family, I don't do family law, right? Mm -hmm. I sent a family law attorney probably 15 or 16 cases, made her five grand a case mm -hmm. and didn't ask for anything in return. Wow. And for like two years, she was like, Brian, I'm so sorry. I, I, I need to get you a case. And so she feels indebted to me, mm -hmm. right? Finally, she calls me. I got this case for you. We ended up making like $1.3 million on that one case. Dang. So long story short, like she was looking for an opportunity because I had just blessed her life. I never once asked for a case. Right. But you got to be willing to sacrifice a little up front, which 100%. most people need to shift their mindset to that. Yeah. If you're, if you're chasing the money, it's going to run, right? If, if you're chasing value, it's going to then compound, right? You're going to give more and more value to other people and they're going to look for ways to bless your life. Yeah. So stop trying to get more stuff and more money. Go provide more value to other people. Don't ask for anything in return. People love to buy. People hate to be sold to. So the moment you become salesy and pitchy and all that stuff, people are out. Absolutely. And you've got a couple companies now, right? Yeah. So we're at four right now. We have a fifth one launching this year. So, wow. Um, so I have the law firm, right? So that, that's a small practice in, in Arizona. We do mostly work in the Southwest. Mm -hmm. um, we have now scaled that uh, nationwide. So one of the hardest things for law firms is to, is to have local counsel, right? Most people think hire a lawyer, um, you know, in every state, get an office secretary. It's really expensive. Right. Um, so what we've done is we have an affiliate network of, of about 150 lawyers right now around the country. And we act as the top of funnel. We do, we do some of the intake work. And we funnel those around to uh, attorneys around the country. Nice. And we basically treat them like associate attorneys. We're the partner. We do the final review. Um, and then their license in their particular jurisdiction, there's fee requ sharing requirements that we have to follow in every state. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really great. I mean, honestly, then the blessing of having guys like you and Keaton and those guys, you know, they have a lot of good connections. Steve, yeah. um, you know, you some, send somebody my way. I had a text for a case today in Tennessee. I'm not wow. licensed in Tennessee. We have local counsel in Tennessee. So it's just a really cool situation to be able to funnel around. Yeah, you're middlemanning basically. Yeah, totally. And and you know, acting as the partner basically on the case. And then we have a lawyer education platform. It's called Quest Day, which is the Latin term for mindset, mm -hmm. which is really cool. Ryan Pineda and I are partners on that. Um, and then we started a rental fleet this last year. Um, it's hard to find rental cars um, that are seven seven passenger trucks or any anything high end. Mm. Um, so particular to that niche. Um, you can go on to enterprise and find you know every other car but we we, we focused on seven seaters trucks and high end smart we, anything over 100 grand um and we have um let's see probably 35 cars at this point. damn yeah in one year one year yeah in wow. three months you went all in on that one <laughs> we made a lot of money i threw it right back in yeah oh, back to the wall and then we have an app that's launching actually so this one's in development right now it's a self-development app it's called ideal day okay yeah, every, you know it's like 75 hard but it's more particular to the to the user. Mm. So basically, pe people can pick their wins for the day, and they can track them every day. And then we have affiliate partnerships with people that sell product online. Nice. So, so how are you balancing all this? I know you got some pillars of life. Where does business rank in all this? Is it number one? It's one of four. Yeah. So I, I, I say, you know, it's not work life balance, right? It's it's work life fulfillment, mm -hmm. right? So faith, family, finance, fitness. So I'm married. I have four kids. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, faith is a big, big part of my life too. It always has been. Um, and now fitness is becoming a part of my life. I'm, I'm running a half marathon, you know, in a couple of weeks. Nice. That's, um, how, how many miles is that? 13.1. 13.1. Wow. Yeah. So, and I'm, you know, trying to, trying to be healthy and all that. I feel like you know, if you're making a ton of money, but you're, you know, relate, but your health was poor, it doesn't really matter. Right. right? Or if you have fantastic health, but you're making no money, like that's kind of sucks too. Right? <laughs> or if you're, if you're, you're making a ton of money, but your relationship at home is in a really hard spot, you're really still in a hard spot. Mm-hmm. Or if you feel like your connection with God or whatever, you know, source you look to is off or you feel confused in that area, there's not peace in your mind. Mm-hmm. So, so in my mind, my job is to find fulfillment in each of those four categories, faith, family, finance, fitness. And there are times when you have to focus on more than, you know, like, like right now, I'm very heavily on, on, on the finance side of it, mm-hmm. pushing really hard, grinding right there. And that requires some sacrifices on the family side. Like mm. I'm, I'm traveling all of this week. Yeah. So my wife is taking care of the kids, right? So, you know, shout out to her. Um, but that's okay because there's a time, you know, we, t- we took two weeks off and took a cruise just as a family and I put finance aside. Right. And, and that's okay. It's all right to balance. It's okay to, um, you know, try to find fulfillment in each. There's no, you don't have to have the same amount of time, but as long as you're fulfilled in each one of those, then you're good. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I love that. Yeah. People try to go all in and then, when they sacrifice, they don't ever come back right. is the problem, which right. which I did for years, honestly, mm-hmm. with my health. I didn't go to the gym for three years, probably, really? when I was first starting. Yeah. Because I was just so locked into making money, man. I saw you doing squats the other day. Yeah, Jeremy I did, was telling me. did two plates, man. Did you really? I was impressed. I don't know if I could do that. Yeah. I, I don't know how I did it. I feel like a lot of lifting is pretty mental, and my yeah. mental strength is at an all-time high. Cool. So I think that definitely helped, because before, I couldn't even squat the bar in high school. Really? I couldn't even do a push-up to, like, college seriously yeah because yeah. i was a distance runner yeah yeah makes sense yeah so i was running miles i could run a mile in 440 440 yeah in high school i couldn't run a lap in 440 <laughs> yeah, seriously though yeah. well that's crazy i mean I'm, when i say that i'm doing the half marathon it is not fast like, yeah I, it's like 10 well some mile. people run it I like not it. for me yeah, like, yeah it is if i finish that's that's the win if it, you could do it without walking that's a win i'd say totally that that's the goal you know, I did an eight mile run two weeks ago and i felt pretty good nice so i, I it's like a three-month training program and I, I feel like I, I wish I was down another 15, 20 pounds because yeah. every pound that comes off just makes it that much easier. We got to get you on a parasite cleanse, man. Dude, you, ever, yeah. you ever do one of those? No. Dude. Oh Seriously? Oh my gosh. Yeah, but you have to be home all week because you're just on I'm the just toilet. ruins you. Yeah. yeah, it ruins you. Parasite cleanse. That's um, crazy. Yeah, man. So what are you working on this year, next year? Where can people find you? You know, right now it's it's building and scaling the firm nationwide. I'm starting to appear on stuff like this, which is really cool. Um, so I'm trying to build a brand. You know, I never had a, I never really had a need um, to build the brand at all. So, so now it's just, you know, connecting with people online and then helping out with legal issues around the country, building the lawyer education platform. So just Instagram, that's a really good place to find me right now. Again, we're, cool. when I was a W2 employee, there's not really much of a need to build a brand. You know? Yeah. We got to get you, uh, get you posted on there more for sure. Yeah. So just Ryan P. Sandstrom on there. You can check us out at, uh, questalaw.com. That's Q U E S T A E law.com. Um, and that's both the, the national firm and the lawyer education platform. Perfect. We'll link it all in the description. Thanks for coming on, man. Thanks, man. This has been great. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys, as always. And we'll see you tomorrow.